Well, hello, everybody, and welcome again to Mind Science TV. Here we have another brand new look again. Uh, this time I'm uh, talking through Skype, uh, and I'm talking to someone really interesting, which must surprise you all because every time I talk, it's someone interesting, but they are. Everybody, there's so many interesting people in the world. This is a, a wonderful guy uh, who I've really only just met, but I hope to have a, a lot of relationship with over, over the years, uh, Peter Rousseau. And uh, Peter is an Australian, although he's been everywhere and done just about everything. Um, let me see if I, if I look at uh, uh, my crib notes. The, um, he's now actually the director of, of the Masters of Counselling uh, program at the School of Psychology up at the University of Queensland. He worked in a place which was a really true, true to my heart because a friend was saved there, and that's St John of God Psychiatric Hospital in Richmond. That was, that was wonderful, Peter. I'll get you to talk about that later. Uh, he's a, a full-time researcher in this work of neurobiology and neuropsychology amongst his teaching, but he also runs a, a group, and we'll put the website up there, the Madeiras Clinical Solutions Group, and it's an education group. So for all the people in Australia, here is where we can go to learn about neuroscience and the neuroscience of psychotherapy uh, and how it works with, uh, we'll talk about more of that stuff as we go along. Uh, I'm very excited to do uh, to be talking to this fella, uh, but I better stop talking or otherwise uh, we won't get to talk to him. So Peter, I want to start off just by saying thank you so much. We've had a couple of technical issues and I really appreciate all the effort and welcome to Mind Science TV. Thank you, Richard. It's lovely to talk to you and uh, uh, you have done some very fascinating interviews and I've really enjoyed them. So uh, it's such a privilege to talk to you today. Yeah, it's really great to have you, have you join in. Uh, there's there's some of the things that um, you know I haven't really mentioned, uh, and we want to talk about some of those those processes. But particularly, I think the workshops. Uh, first of all, I think they're terrific, and people should go to them, and they should look at look at the opportunities of them, because they cover great territory. And you know, we'll we'll talk about this more. Uh, we're talking about general anxiety disorder, talking about seasonal affective disorder, which people don't know too much about. But you've been doing this for about 20 odd years, 20, 30 years, and uh, you've been in various places around the world. And I'm interested always talking to people like yourself. How have you seen the movements and the shifts and the development of neuroscience as a viable way of applying uh, our, our to, as a viable thing to apply to, to psychotherapy? Give us a bit of your reflections on that before we get into some specifics. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Richard. Um, yeah, my background is clinical neuroscience, and I've been in this field for probably 30 odd years now. Uh, studied originally in South Africa, did my PhD in Holland, and uh, had a, a teaching stint in Holland as well as in Canada, and been in, uh, in Australia for quite a number of years. Uh, as you mentioned, the um, health services in Sydney, I've been the clinical director of the two health services of the uh, St. John of God hospitals, both in Richmond and in Burwood, uh, in Sydney, as well as some day clinics. Um, and uh, I've late been teaching uh, and the research here at the Queensland University and the um, Queensland Brain Institute. Um, now, through the years, uh, the field of uh, neuroscience, neuropsychotherapy, neuropsychology have actually uh, underwent a few significant changes, which is quite remarkable, especially in terms of people working in the field of mental health and uh, more particularly the, the so-called talking therapies. Um, now, just to, to start off with a, a tiny bit of, uh, of historical information, historically, uh, in the late 19th century, uh, uh, neuro researchers basically saw the brain as a mass of tissue, which is similar to the liver, the heart, etc. Mm. And at that stage, through the advances in um, uh, scientific discovery, the microscope, etc., uh, early scientists like Cajal and Golgi, Camilo Golgi, uh, Waldaya, they discovered that the brain is actually a network of fibers, and uh, hence the so-called neuron theory or neuron doctrine was uh, introduced uh, realizing that the brain is actually a huge number of connections of fibers. Um, the initial notion was that all of these fibers interconnect 
and uh, they just talk every way to each other. Um, uh, something that's not well known, there was this very young, uh, amazing researcher uh, in neuroscience called Sigmund Freud. Now this guy did some research at that stage on the brains of crayfish. Now most people are not aware of the early life of Freud and his work in neuroscience. What he discovered was that neurons don't touch. And in a very insignificant paper in 1884, young Freud uh, suggested that in that space between two neurons is where the subconsciousness sit. And that was actually the start of understanding feelings, emotions, uh, wellness, uh, mental health, etc. And he suggested that neurosis, which was the, the um, presenting issue at the time that uh, uh, physicians try to cure, neurosis is the result of unhealthy connections between these neurons. And he also made even a more profound suggestion, and that is by talking to someone, we can change these neural connections. And of course, his uh, fellow physicians thought that he is totally crazy, doesn't make sense, and Freud started to write this project for a scientific um, uh, psychology to explain neurosis on a neural basis. Unfortunately, two things happened to young Freud. One is, um, he, his discovery just was not uh, met by the ability from current neuroscience in terms of microscopes, uh, research ability to prove his theory. And the second problem that Freud faced was more personal. He fell in love. And when he fell in love, he needs money. And at that stage, which is not different from these days, there's no money in research. So he dropped his neural research and became an, an analyst. And the rest is history, the birth of analysis. He moved from understanding the brain from a neural perspective to metaphors, etc., the birth of analysis. However, uh, the brain was at that stage seen as this mass of tissue, but then people realized there's a lot of stuff happening in these neurons. It moved to, in the early 20th century, to an understanding of the brain as an electrical system. People like Bernstein discovered that within these tiny neurons, there's electrical charges, and these charges tend to discharge to other neurons, which was then called synaptic potentials, or the so-called action potentials leading to the, the theory that the brain is an electrical system. And for many years, actually a number of decades, the basis of understanding mental illness was understanding the electrical currents in the brain, etc. Hence the birth of treatment, which we call ECTs, right. shock therapy or electroconvulsive therapies. Uh, in the late 50s, I'm jumping 50 years, all ECTs, we still use ECTs to this day, but new discoveries led to a new theory, understanding that actually what activates these action potentials, these electrical activities in the brain, is a chemical called acetylcholine. And acetylcholine activates the electrical system, which was the birth of the so-called uh, chemical model of the brain which now we refer to these days as the medical model, which means the brain is a bowl of soup. We need to get the balance in the soup right, and the soup will taste nice. If the soup balance is not good, the soup will taste bad, and we have pathology, we have mental illness. The guy who actually did the main work in demonstrating this change, the, the so-called chemical model, was actually a Sydney cider called John Eccles and he received his Nobel Prize in medicine in, in the early 60s for this amazing work. So that was the birth of a new paradigm of understanding the brain from the electrical model to a chemical model. In the late 90s, now we're jumping to the end of the last century, another researcher called Eric Kandel, um, he was always a bit uncomfortable with the soup theory and he maintained that somehow the brain is just not a bowl of soup, there's a little bit more. It's not just about the right chemicals, the right medication, and someone will be fine. There's something else that we need to explore. 
And he had this notion that it's about the connections in the brain, the networks, rather than the soup. So in order to demonstrate this, he did research on what's called, uh, we refer to this these days as memory. If we can understand how memory operates, we understand how the brain operates, and we can facilitate new changes in the brain. So Kandel did some research with a system. Normally we thought the, brain is, uh, the basis of the brain's memory is the so-called hippocampus. We can talk about this later. And he did research with a system that doesn't have a hippocampus, which is a sea slug. And working with sea slugs, he demonstrated that he can physically change memory systems of the sea slug. And he cracked the code for sea slugs and received the, the Nobel Prize for um, uh, medicine and neurobiology in 2000. That led to a totally new paradigm of how we understand how the brain operates, which basically w means the end of the medical model. We are in the midst of a new model. And Kandel wrote a beautiful article in 1998 already indicating this. He said, we are in the midst of a remarkable scientific revolution, a revolution that's about to change how we do therapy for the 21st century. And he indicates, in, that was in 98. Since then, all of this has been demonstrated. We'll talk about this yes, later. Yes. But in this article, he said, when a therapist speaks, when you talk to your client and your client listens to you, the action of neural machinery in your brain is having an effect on the neural machinery of your client's brain. And then he makes this amazing uh, comment. He said, insofar as your words produce changes in your patient's mind, it is most likely that your words will produce changes in the patient's brain. Now, he actually went straight back to Freud, mm. indicating by talking to someone, not only changes how we feel, but changes the hardware of the brain. And that's where we're at at the moment. So it's a long answer to your question. Oh, no. What's, what's been happening is this remarkable revolution that we realize talking therapy seems to make a massive difference in terms of how the brain operates. Oh, no, 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 Peter, it was it was a it was a beautiful um, potted history. It, it was it was great. You might uh, have heard of my mentor Ernest Rossi. Oh, uh, there you go. Yeah, you know Ernie quite well. He's and Ernie's been talking about this also, you know, since the 80s and 90s, and and he's a great uh, great fan of Candell's, and uh, you know we we, sure. we we talk about that quite a lot. And and then interesting Joseph Ledoux, who did so much work with uh, the, uh, with the, the nature of the way things work, but his book The Synaptic Self, saying we can start to look at these synapses. Now it's possibly you know a little bit deeper than uh, uh, you know we, we need to go to necessarily in this talk, but I think we can both of us you know are, are excited by the fact that when you start getting down to these these chemicals rather than these mechanical processes going on there is this milieu if not a soup it's a milieu and it has a conversation with itself absolutely right and it and it's a beautiful it's a beautiful beautiful thing and i think that uh, and i'm sure you do uh, and and i'm yet to see close up more of your stuff i'm very excited about it so okay so we've got to now and what we've got to is this wonderful understanding that talking affecting somebody's mental state, affecting their mind, uh, uh, actually has then biological results and biological impacts. So the medical model is still, is still useful, but you can actually alter the, the, the chemicals through interaction and engagement, and this is beautiful. Uh, so let's take the next step, because I know one of the other groups that you, uh, you belong to, which is dear to me, is the Global Association of Interpersonal Neurobiology Studies. And I'm actually wild and crazy. I actually, I'm actually on the board, so I get up at 3.30 in the morning and have board meetings. But this interpersonal nature of, of the way we started to tap into that, I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more now about how that has changed and how that is growing and what some of your reflections are on, on that interaction, how what you say changes the other person. Sure, sure. 
Um, Richard, this is part of what Kandel initially referred to and he was hinted towards this. Since then, we have clear evidence how this uh, actually happens in the brain. We can talk about these neural processes. Uh, but in principle, what that refers to is my brain does not exist in isolation. It only exists in relation to its environment. And on that level, right now, at this moment, my brain is connecting and connected to your brain. And there's some interaction happening. And as this interaction is happening, the neural pathways in my brain is making some small changes. And the same is happening in your brain. As a result, at the end of our conversation, what happened between our interaction facilitated some good shift in hopefully both our brains, which means the interaction facilitated some change. We know the opposite for a long time now. Let's go back to World War II. We've seen a lot of soldiers being involved in World War II, experience some horrible situations, and suddenly they get diabetes, they end up with um, all sorts of physiological distress due to being exposed to some experiences. Experience tend to change our biochemistry, our neurochemistry quite significant. What's never been realized is we can do the opposite as well. We can also, through our intervention, through talking, activate new pathways. Now, two things happen in this process, and we can later on discuss the details of how it actually facilitates on a neurocellular level. But what basically happens is when we talk to each other, and you, my therapist, and I talk to you, I feel safe. When I feel safe, certain chemicals change, which makes me more susceptible for what you suggest to me. And when those chemicals are uh, facilitated, I'm not fearful, I'm not um, anxious, and the more I feel relaxed, the more what you suggest to me can be helpful. So you're facilitating some chemical changes, which then enhance the connection of new neural pathways. And eventually the pathways get enhanced and strengthened, and we see the facilitation of new patterns. Mm -hmm. So talking makes a big difference. What Kandel referred to is this interaction of my brain with yours is something that he did not exactly, um, uh, he couldn't exactly explain at that stage. He just knew there's some connection. Now we uh, research by people like Richard Davidson, um, uh, Marco Jacoboni, the colleague of um, Dan Siegel, one of my colleagues in, in Holland, uh, Christian Cases. They've identified a system called the mirror neurons. Now, it seems this mirror neuron effect is an effect that happens that activates your behavior, your feelings into my brain and eventually facilitate my brain to adjust to the way your brain operates. So that mirror neuron effect has a positive effect in facilitating positive change. Unfortunately, there's a downside to this. Trauma, um, uh, negative uh, experiences also facilitate negative outcomes, hence the need for talking therapies. Mm. I, I think this is, this is a really important point to, to, to bring forward, both in, in when we're looking at clients and in their past life and the traumas that they have, but that the actual therapy room, if we're not careful, can be a traumatic place. So there's lots of things. This interaction is going on all the time. I mean, I, mean, I loved uh, uh, in the Rizzolatti's uh, paper, one of the, the original discoverers of, of the mirror neurons, as you know, but his, uh, his paper, he put out one uh, just last year, I think, or towards the end of the year before, but wanting to remind people that it was uh, the mirror neurons were about understanding our motor potentials and our motor capacities. And what, to me, he was highlighting was that we are a very motor-oriented being, species, and, and as Ernie says, activity dependent. We respond to activity and we respond to activity with activity. So it, it's, uh, it's really rounding up what you've been saying. That's true, but we need to remember what Rizzolati and Bucati in Italy initially focused on the macaque monkeys was to the motor cortex, exactly right. right. What people like Jacoboni did, he focused on the areas of rocker. So he focused on how mirror neuron effects also affect uh, visual uh, responses. 
what Christian Kaisers does with he folks in terms of emotional mirror neuron. So they extended the concept of mirror neurons and they actually realized that mirror neurons are quite robust right through the brain. Um, so the initial discovery, exactly right what you say, was in the motor cortex area. But it's, research has extended this to more areas. So it seems there's this uh, a science that we don't have a fully understanding of yet, um, which I did a paper in the International Mental Health Conference last year, which I called the neuroscience of us, which is the interconnection of brain, the, uh, the, the sense of interconnectedness. And that's a very, very important therapeutic aspect. Um, which one of my PhD students is doing a, a study on the role of the therapeutic alliance, which is a right brain to right brain communication, which Alan Shaw, your colleague, also referred to quite a lot, and link into attachment theory. Those kind of aspects are so important for clients to feel safe and to foster that sense of safety, which is the holding pattern for clients to get better. Without this, it's just a bag of tricks that we try to introduce, which is not ideal. Yeah, I mean, I'm so glad you, you extended that and didn't, didn't let my statements be the end because that's exactly right. And what I was actually sort of um, inclining, but it's your interview, so I didn't talk too much. But, and you brought it up so beautifully, but that movement, emotions, perception, uh, uh, empathy, these things are all working in some kind of interaction, some kind of interplay. They're not separate. Uh, at all, yeah. and it was lovely. I, I married a, a, a massage therapist, so oh, um, beautiful, you know. So, and she's a, a researcher as well. So, so we're how fortunate some people. <laughs> I, I wish she had time to massage me. <laughs> <laughs> now, what what this has has led to is a whole different set of education systems. Um, now, you're doing this masters of counselling. And a lot of people would think counselling, you know, what, what that, that sort of is in this box and psychotherapy is in this box and psychology is in this box. But it's not true. Everything to do with human interaction has a neuroscience benefit. Uh, now, one of the things that brought us together was uh, a, a lovely uh, project, which is actually in a, from Australia, based in Australia, uh, call, uh, based on a website. Uh, neuropsychotherapy.com and uh, and I think this is a wonderful initiative uh, particularly in Australia America's a little bit more ahead in understanding what psychotherapy is but in this point I want to just shift a little bit more into the stuff you teach and some of the things you teach in your workshops and um, how do you find people coming in because you teach doctors you teach psychologists you teach counselors you teach psychotherapists what are some of the responses you find in the interactions when you bring these um, this this sort of really humanistic magical joy of the brain into their uh, you know their sort of rather cold you know, dissected experience sure. Well, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, I do um, my, my uh, workshops are are open workshops and just the last year we had over 2,000 clinicians attending the workshop, so it's big, big numbers um, of, of clinicians who attend workshops. We normally book out the auditoriums at Royal Melbourne Hospital, Royal Brisbane Hospital, and the auditoriums are just booked out. So um, I'm constantly surprised to see the number of clinicians very eager to learn about what's the link of what I'm doing in terms of, of the brain and what's happening in the brain. and. The way I see this is I, we do not provide a new model and uh, or modality of uh, therapy. What we do offer is a good understanding of what's happened on a neural basis. And what we found is then people can apply these meta theory, the baseline theory, on top of what they're doing and, uh, and enhance what they're doing as long as it adheres to the basic principles of neuroscience. And uh, that strengthens what they do. Uh, just a few weeks ago in a workshop here in, um, in Brisbane, a, a GP said to me, I've been doing mental health uh, uh, general practice for 20 years now and for the first time I feel confident that I can explain to my patients why we need to do certain things, what's going on in terms of neural activation. And despite all the medical training, we never really made the link between mental health and brain processes and neural structures and neurochemicals. Um, and 
all of our research indicate, and a number of my, of my studies indicate that adherence to even medication, to therapy, uh, is directly linked to some level of uh, enhancing a sense of control, a sense of understanding, a sense of, I know why I need to do what I'm doing. Uh, and through this process, which, which has to do with downregulation of the stress, downregulation of fear, not knowing upregulates fear. When we don't know, we feel more fearful. So the more you explain to your client, this is why we need to do, this is what's happening in the brain, the more they feel in control and is willing to apply whatever uh, uh, principles we explain because it makes sense. So neuroscience seems to play a huge role in helping to enhance that sense of empowerment from a client's perspective. And for clinicians, a lot of clinicians, especially from um, more right brain orientated um, uh, uh, modalities like person-centered therapies, analysis, um, uh, and narrative therapies, etc., feel so much more empowered because we realize that's the basis of how the brain operates. Yeah. Now, I think this is just so, I, mean, I had a very personal uh, experience of, of how this works is in that my daughter, uh, recently they discovered a benign uh, cyst. It was an astrocytoma in, in her brain. It was surface and uh, uh, she would ring me and she said, Dad, I've just had this really long lecture about what it all is. You know, I've got a this and a this and a that and a this and a this and we do that and we do. But Dad, could you tell me, what does that mean for me as a person? Absolutely. And this is the new teaching. Uh, uh, Bonnie Badenoch, who uh, is wonderful yeah, also with brain the brain therapist. Yeah. And she does that so beautifully uh, uh, when she talks about the, the, the prefrontal cortex sending uh, gabaergic embraces down to the amygdala to quiet their, you know, their distress. Absolutely. Beautiful. Yeah, so what we've developed in terms of, of training is actually uh, four workshops, two-day workshops. The one is on the brain and anxiety, understanding anxiety from a neural perspective and some therapeutic approaches to treat this. We've developed a second two-day workshop on the neuroscience of depression, um, new treatment options to manage and uh, treat depression. Our third workshop um, is on the social brain and the neuroscience of relationships. Um, linked into some of Cosolino's work and others. And at the fourth workshop, which in terms of our series should have been the first one, but it's a little bit like the Star Wars series. Now you start with one and you actually do the first one later because for all sorts of reasons. Um, the, the, other, the last workshop, which should have been the first in the series, is on the developing brain and the neuroscience of memory and trauma. Um, which forms actually the foundation of which on which the others build. So then we have the we have the four two day workshops, and an, a huge number of clinicians who attended this said to me, "We want more skills. We want to, uh, we want more practical applications." So as a result of this, I've now developed two one day workshops, which are applied skills, which we focus on case studies to apply depression, and the other one is anxiety from a neuroscience perspective, and just enhance clinicians ability to uh, interact, which is more small group. Um, we limit the numbers of these groups to a maximum of 40, so it's very interactive case study discussions, etc. And that's the series of workshops. And I've recently been asked by, uh, by Norton to, uh, to write a book on uh, psychotherapy, so on, on the neuroscience of applied psychotherapy. So this hopefully will be ready by the end of the year. Ah, oh, that's great. That's great. I love it. I love it because uh, I know Norton's quite well, and uh, you know some good friends of mine are, are writing some some good things. Yay! I'm very excited about that. Fantastic. Uh, you're in for some fun. <laughs> <laughs> we are. Uh, luckily, the brain is such a wonderful area to work with, and it's such a. I, I, I constantly just feel we are so privileged to live at this stage with new developments and what's been happening. It actually has brought psychotherapy into such a unique niche that we can provide in terms of wellness for so many people on so many levels. Yeah, I, I was talking to Russell Mears uh, a little while ago, who's. Uh, uh, done the conversational model and, and oh, done, yeah. done a great deal of stuff, but he's just retired. And he said exactly that. He said, oh my God, I wish I were your age, uh, and which made me feel young, but, yeah. but for him it was 20 years earlier. So I think, I think you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's, it's exciting. And I think all therapists need to listen to this work. And 
what I want to do is something which is kind of a bit of a two-edged sword because I find it a bit of the problem with, with brain science and brain um, lecturing is that we're doing knickknacks now. We're doing uh, nifty doodads uh, where people go in, they look at a, something, they walk out with the three steps to whatever, and it needs a deeper understanding. But having said mm. that, that I'm not, I'm, I don't agree with just sort of saying, go do this with your patients, trust me, it will work. What are a couple of things? I'm, I mean, one of the things that interests me a lot, because my mother suffered from this, and I did a lot of work with Reed Wilson, uh, who does a lot of work with trauma and anxiety. Uh, in the anxiety workshop, I mean, general uh, GAD, you know, general anxiety disorder, what are some of the, there's a couple of things that um, perhaps, uh, with, without trying to pretend that they're whole therapies, but just a couple of insights into the way you found neuroscience has altered your approach and improved your, your presentation and work with clients? Um, focusing on uh, anxiety disorders in particular, uh, anxiety disorders are very, very closely linked to some of the very primitive systems in the brain. Uh, when we look at how the brain develops um, uh, from a prenatal development, uh, the very first parts of the brain that develop in the, in the prenatal phase is the so-called neural plates. And when these neural plates form, they send their stem cells to produce more and more neurons in more areas of the brain. Um, just a matter of interest, you know, at its height, these stem cells produce 250,000 new neurons per minute. Per minute, I know. Uh, it, the, the growth is just astounding. Now, we can talk about this at another stage, but just imagine what happens if we compromise that neural growth through the amino acids of the mum by bad nutrition, by taking bad drugs, etc. You compromise amino acid building. Now, amino acids is unfortunately something that the embryo cannot produce itself. It has to come from the mother. So if we compromise that, that system, we compromise the development of the brain significantly. I'm working with some uh, 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 collaboration, one of my colleagues in, um, in Melbourne, who's doing some research with developing brains of mums, of the babies where the mums have been addicted to heroin. And we see huge changes in terms of those brains and try to maximize this through what we call enriched environments. But that's another issue. Now, in terms of the, in terms of the developing brain, when these uh, areas of the brain develop, the, uh, the, primit the most primitive part of the brain, which is sitting in the brain stem and the pons area, which is the back of the brain, those areas develop first, and that's the area of the brain that's responsible for our breathing, for our heart rate, um, for uh, basic um, uh, survival responses. The second part of the brain that develops is sitting right on top of this, in the deep center of the brain, in the middle of the brain, and that's later called by a person called Paul McLean, the so-called limbic system. That's areas that most people have heard of, like the amygdala, the hippocampus, the thalamus, the hypothalamus, the basal ganglia. Now those areas, interesting enough, are fully developed at birth, but not fully operational. Within the first 10 months, things that happen to us, bangs at the door, little trauma or big trauma, malnutrition, abuse, those things activate this system to form certain pathways. These pathways can be helpful or can be protective. When it's too protective, the brain development is actually compromised due to this protective system. Hence, we see the emergence of what we refer to now as the anxious brain. We have a brain system that's geared towards protecting itself rather than feeling relaxed and just approach new things as if this is interesting. So, Anxiety disorders have this very strong link to our genetics and how these genetics play out in terms of early experiences, the so-called genetic expressions, resulting in people being anxious. So what we need to do in therapy is find ways to relax those primitive systems, yes. which means, and some people have proposed stuff from the frontal part of the brain, the so-called cognitive therapies. Others said, no, do, do hypnosis. And others say, well, what about just mindfulness? And what about just meditation, etc.? But the neuroscience of this is, as long as we work towards relaxing those primitive systems, 
we can facilitate healthier processes of experiencing levels of control. So enhancing control, reducing that fear response system. And how you do this is a unique strategy with each and every client that's quite different and quite unique. But that's the neuroscience of it. As long as clinicians are aware of the neuroscience, they can find strategies that fit well with a particular client. And, and this is the, the Ericksonian idea of utilization, that, that a therapy is, is, is as useless for one person as it is useful for, for another. Absolutely. And, and Ernie Absolutely. Rossi taking this forward with the psychosocial genomics, which, um, uh, you know, just when I thought I understood the brain, he said, hey, how about the gene? Wow, you know. Yeah. But, um, you know, uh, Moshe Ziff and Meany, who are doing this fabulous work at, at looking exactly as what you're saying, at just the mechanisms of how the gene expression changes with a, with a distressing uh, infancy, and then this all supports uh, all this wonderful stuff of Alan Shaw, as you say, in interpersonal neurobiology. So for a change, we seem to be entering into a world of, of sort of academic or intellectual or, or, or you know so sort of this sort of study serious study where they're all overlapping each other and they can't help it you just can't limit yourself to a specific discipline because you just don't know you know you miss stuff yeah yeah I, I agree and I think it's it, it's a matter of how all of these different areas right through from uh, spirituality to yes. um, uh, this concept of mindfulness into our physiology, into our social interaction, into our genetics. They're all interplay and we need to be mindful of this very complex interaction. But the beauty, as complex as it is, uh, we are empowered to, to facilitate some changes. Yes. We are not in a situation where we feel it's all doom and gloom. We are just predestined in a certain direction. Every single person can make a difference to his or her wellness. And what we as therapists can do is just in a safe environment facilitate some of those changes. And from there, the world's their oyster and they can develop even further. This thing again, activity dependent. I, I actually quite love it. Steven Pinker, uh, who's a linguist, but also a neuroscientist and how I, I got into this stuff uh, initially. But he talks about language. He talks about uh, language. Uh, hangs itself around uh, the, like a car, like a, the, the chassis of the verb. Yep. And I just love the analogy because that's the thing. We, yep. we hang ourselves around the activity and it, and it all works. So let's just, because um, I'm just sort of keeping an eye on, on time. We could talk for hours. We, we better be careful we don't. Uh, but the, let's ex I'd love to expand it out. So we've been very much sort of above the, above the neck for the, the last little while. But it's a whole system. You know, the, the neck, you know, as I say to some uh, uh, clients, say, look, it's, it's connected and hollow. Uh, so one of the things which you bring up in, um, in your workshops uh, in the, uh, uh, no, I'm not quite sure which one, you can remind me which one, but a thing which is called SAD, which is great because it's what it does, what's called seasonal affective disorder, and then what um, resulting in what we call sickness behavior, which is a, way, a, a nature of the way in which things that are going on in the body are actually then talking and giving the brain this change in process so, so that's enough of introduction uh, please just give us a bit more about that to show us that we're not just dealing neck up yep um, there's a number of, uh, of um, uh, links to in, in terms of our neurophysiology that we need to be mindful of but also in terms of your reference to seasonal affective disorder uh, also indicates the link between us and our environment yes. between us and what's happening in terms of our ecosystem um, and the initial phrase that's been coined in terms of seasonal affective disorder was linked into some people experience shift. It's like a it's like a wave. From time to time they're better, and then it seems as if they just get worse. And then things get better again, and then gets worse. That people refer to this seems to be seasonal. Um, it's like seasons; they come and they go. Uh, and this interplay seems to have a huge effect on on people's wellness. From time to time they demonstrate I feel reasonably well and then suddenly it feels like the wheels coming off for no uh, specific reason it's not as if something triggered this that one can attribute the unwellness to a particular event mm. it it just suddenly appears so 
for a long time, again, something like uh, SAD was linked into um, uh, an SAD in seasonal affective, not in terms of social anxiety disorder. Yes, that's seasonal all. affective, yeah, get it right. Um, uh, that was linked into uh, maybe some neurochemical changes, and some people experience some shift in terms of their neurochemical buildup, and as a result of the buildup that drops, uh, we see a cascade of these kind of symptoms. So it was explained from the soup model, the neurochemical model, as neurochemical changes. Now in terms of the network theory, we realize it's a little bit more complex. And the treatment of this has to do with building resilience rather than just treating this with a neurochemical compound. So it's a big shift towards, uh, I think, a much healthier approach, realizing we need to enhance our own resilience. So even if there is some of these changes that people experience, they can facilitate some activities to enhance their wellness rather than to drift into deeper and deeper depression, for example. So uh, that shift can be facilitated through, for example, um, healthy eating, good um, exercise, uh, good quality sleep, which is a very important topic in itself. Um, the, the role of social interaction, what people normally do when they drift into this uh, negative cycle of the, of, of the, of the SAD, uh, they eventually start to withdraw themselves. What we know now these days, the more we withdraw ourselves, the more the brain is at risk because the more we are at risk of not uh, uh, facilitating effective neural activation resulting in a bigger drop. So the process enhances itself. So there's some things, some barriers that we can build in to protect ourselves rather than to uh, drift into a default pattern of unwellness. Mm. So our, our bag of goodies is uh, more than just therapies. Uh, it's when they're talking about lifestyle, uh, and uh, I was very fortunate as I say, with, with with my wife because she's just completed the Masters of Lifestyle Medicine. She's one of the first ones out of it uh, up at Southern Cross, and this this nature of vitamin D is is a is is a a huge thing. But like happens so often, like now it's all vitamin D or it's all lifestyle, which is still a game. I think what you're saying, and 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 I'm if I'm interpreting is certainly what I think too is no it's the interplay it's the interaction it's how much weight you you give uh, your system how or how much imbalance you, you force your system to deal with and if it can't get a good balance it will go into a bad balance absolutely and and what we now realize in terms of neural uh, um, maximization and uh, neural proliferation is as soon as we isolate an individual, the risk of unwellness increases. Um, interaction plays a massive role in wellness. And what we need to do is healthy interaction, which is a, what we call enriched environments. And that's where, again, where therapy becomes the micro holding tank for a short while of facilitating that wellness. And then it extends to normal relationship, catching up with others, having a good lifestyle, etc. So therapy is like the, the small holding tank that eventually facilitates some significant changes in the sense of safety, a sense of trust again for the individual to extend this into his or her normal world and where they, where they uh, operate on a daily basis. Yeah, and, and, and this is this is, this is it's a tricky task for uh, for a therapist. I, I, I once in a in a, a magazine article I, I likened it to people come in from the war zone and they come into our space and we're the hospital and we heal them we make them feel wonderful and then we send them back out to the front line. Uh, so having people understand, I think, uh, that the world is a place we respond to, and if if you respond to it in these negative ways, you're going to have these responses. And the neuroscience just really seems to, in, in my uh, process and the way I work, it also seems to be one of the best ways to cut through uh, the understanding uh, aspect of it. Not with everybody, but quite often, uh, more often than not, I find. Absolutely. I think it just enhances our sense of control, a sense of understanding, which also provides something else. One of the key neurochemicals that we all need on a regular basis is a bit of release of dopamine. Now, dopamine motivates us to do things. When we're in therapy, and you as my therapist explain to me, these things are happening, 
That's why we need to do this. There's a tiny bit of dopamine release that enhances the motivation to then comply. As soon as that interaction drops, the dopamine drops as well. And eventually, the motivation to continue uh, any intervention to enhance the outcomes um, are compromised. So uh, a bit of that dopamine release is actually quite important. However, there is a downside to the same chemical dopamine. That is when clients, for example, are severely depressed and they feel safe when they're sitting at home and not talking to anyone. Eventually, the dopamine gets released when they sit at home. So we get a motivation to enhance the pattern of avoidance, which means we tend to refer this in classical uh, therapy as, oh, there's, resi uh, there's resistance and there's uh, um, therapy resistant clients. But that's that dopamine release that basically tells them my only survival, my only safety is by not engaging. So facilitating for a client the ability to engage and to feel safe enough to engage and eventually to change. That's, as you say, with the war zone, that is a big ask because clients need to feel safe enough to try something new and realize this may help me to, to change and eventually feel report back and say, Richard, this is helping. Something's working here. Mm. And that's where you see the dopamine has shifted to more helpful patterns. And, and it is interesting that, that dopamine is so much better uh, distributed by natural, by natural responses. Because the, the yeah, because the difficulty with medication is, uh, uh, and I was just fascinated uh, when I was researching this, that we have you know three or four dopamine systems, and one wants to go up, and the other one wants to come down, and the other one wants to go up, and uh, you know you you just add dopamine externally through a tablet or whatever it is, and one system feels better, but then another system goes right off, and and, and this this idea of if we can learn more and more about how to through this interpersonal interaction, get the body to to stabilize its own. It it seems to know what the soup, what what's good soup. <laughs> that's a that's a very good example because what happens with especially with dopamine, as we know, dopamine, especially the dopamine produced by the dopamine receptors in the brain, um, we cannot add to that dopamine by taking a tablet because it cannot jump the brain blood barrier. So the problem is with uh, dopamine is we need to find a substitute that activates the dopamine receptors to produce more dopamine. And um, of course, you know the study that's been done with the um, uh, people in the, uh, in, in the uh, psych unit which uh, were all um, uh, struggling with quite severe um, mental illness and as a result of this um, there was this very interesting, uh, you know, the, um, uh, the movie that's been out a few years ago, um, uh, uh, Awakenings, yeah. uh, where they introduced the substance called L-DOPA. Now, L-DOPA can jump the brain blood barrier, and suddenly it uh, enhanced dopamine release. So even people with severe Parkinsonians uh, uh, experience high levels of dopamine release, and the, the um, motor co uh, complex operated more effectively, the communication to the motor cor the cortex operated better and people uh, become fantastically better. The only downside was when this is introduced, you need to constantly increase the number of L-DOPA in order to have the same result and eventually people became psychotic. So uh, chemicals is a tricky one when we mess with this, so we need to be very mindful of how can we enhance dopamine, for example, in a healthier in a healthier way rather than to just say to everyone, take L-DOPA and you'll be fine. Um, and we know now exercise, um, a good nutrition, good sleep, enhance the production of dopamine, reducing stress levels, meaning less cortisol, less adrenocorticotrophin hormone, less corticotrophin releasing factor, enhance the production of the basal ganglia and dopamine. So uh, there's much more healthier things we can do yeah. to enhance this. And that's part of our psychoeducational work as well as our interventions, our clients, and they realize when I do things, my brain's getting better. Yeah. What I'm getting the feeling, and uh, if I can reflect on what perhaps some of the listeners are going is, wow, this is really complicated. Um, and yet it's not. It's, it, what it is, is, is it's very specific, 
But no, we can't sit here in an hour and give you the answers to what's going on. This is really, a, uh, and one of the reasons why I'm doing Mind Science TV, is it's a very wide education program, and you need to be patient as a as a practitioner, and take your time, and do more than one thing, and do more than read one book, and do more than go to one seminar, and just quietly, patiently, find those things that are strong and work for you. And I think what you've done and what I want people now, just in case they were thinking, oh my God, you know, too much, is what you've done is you've, you've pointed them, you've shone l l a lights on different areas, on lifestyle, you've shone lights on, on activities in the brain, you've shone lights on things. So I want everyone who's watching to, to if they haven't, to take notes and go back, get onto, the, get onto the, the research and look it up and learn and learn. Mm -hmm. And of course, come to your workshops. What an excellent idea! But you know. well, people are most welcome. Of yeah. course, um, uh, this is more specifically for clinicians, but they're welcome to have a look on our website. Which is, um, can I mention my website? Oh no, Andrew, I'll put it up as well. But but please tell us oh, what it oh, is. Yeah, yeah, it's just www.mediros.com.au. But we do have our workshops up there, and um, uh, we run a number of again this year, both in. Um, uh, Sydney, Brisbane, Adelaide, Canberra, um, Melbourne, oh, yeah. Perth, all, all the major cities. Uh, so the workshops are available. Uh, and then of course what you said I think is most important. Um, just revisit your interviews, listening through this, take it one step at a time. What, what you basically said is underlining one of the key principles of neuroscience and that is a brain does not change by one brief moment of understanding the brain changes by constant activation. Think about driving a car. Um, we basically know how to drive a car, but initially uh, we can have all the understanding of all the mechanics, but driving a car is actually quite a complex action. Mm. You need to hit the petrol and concentrate where you're driving and focus and look in the rear view mirror uh, there's a lot of things that need to happen simultaneously and it, eventually we can also turn on the radio, have a chat with someone else, turn down the window because the brain gets so used to this. We need to con ongoingly activate certain patterns. The more we activate good patterns, the more we establish good neural pathways. The more we enhance unhelpful patterns, unfortunately, the more we strengthen what we refer to as pathology. So uh, the good news is we can change and the brain can change and it's always ready to say activate me and I'll do it. Fantastic. Fant I, I think that's probably a pretty good spot to, to sort of wind up. I, I, it was wonderful. I mean there was great stuff. We went through history, we went through uh, you know, neuroscience, we went through some of your personal stuff, we went through some of your attitudes towards things, all these lovely um, spotlights on various areas to look. But that beautiful message that I kept hearing all the way through, this interconnects with that, interrelates with that, affects this, builds this, and yada, yada, and this, this beautiful uh, interplay, which, uh, yeah. which is a word I love, we were talking about before. Yeah. So yeah. Is, there, is there any uh, other uh, you know, final word of wisdom or joy, or uh, are you pretty pleased with uh, the, the, what you've put yeah. forward? Lovely to talk to you, Richard, and I uh, hope we'll catch up again. Okay. Well, uh, hang around because we'll, we'll have a chat before we end, but I'll just say go so goodbye, everybody. This is great. Uh, so for those of you in Australia like me who kept traveling overseas to learn this stuff, uh, we've got great availability here through Peter. And uh, uh, I mentioned the, uh, the neurotherapist.com. Uh, that's a fan, uh, neuropsychotherapist.com. That's a really new interesting thing, so I'm getting involved with that. And uh, thank you so much for listening, and we look forward to seeing you next time. So for now, bye-bye, everyone.